I'll walk away for a bit, come back, and after about 20 minutes, hopefully the needle won't have moved. I've got here both the timing chests, one for each engine, important piece of kit. We've decided to do both of them at the same time um, so that we can carry out the same process. Timing uh, chests on the engine, very important. And for the purpose of discussion, if we divide the engine into two halves, first of all, you've got the bottom half and the crankshaft is spinning around at a, a fair rate of knots and the pistons are going up and down. And then you've got the top half of the engine. And what's going on there is the fuel and the air is being injected in order for it to create the explosions, which makes the pistons move up and down in the first place. At exactly the same time, the drive for certain components to make all this happen, such as a fuel injection pump, the water pump, and the dynamo, all comes off of this time in chest. So it's very important that this works correctly and it runs in good order. You can see all the bearings have been replaced and they're running quite uh, freely now. And notice that on the sprocket, you've got a triple chain here. Yeah? This is one of the spares that we got from Australia. And you can see the makeup of the triple chain, just like your bike chain times three. We managed to get a um, new old stock one, so they come in the original box. Off of these components here are what we call lay rub couplings. And a lay rub coupling is a flexible drive that allows the vibration and any shock that's um, engaged when this is whizzing around and it starts up uh, to be accommodated. You can see from this one um, that the actual rubber in the holes is completely shot so it wouldn't be um, absorbing any shock at all. And again, on the completed lay rub coupling, you can see with the new ones that we've got from Australia, absolutely perfect. And they'll bolt onto here and then feed, in this case, the fan drives, and on this side, the fuel injection pump um, and the dynamo. This is the crankshaft for the second engine, which requires some going, uh, grinding on the big ends for the conrods, which is now being done. We uh, obtain undersized bearings from Australia, and this has been ground to size. The next process, before it can be fitted into the crankcase, is to sort out the main bearings, which support the weight of the crankshaft in the engine. Again, so we don't reduce the life of the crankshaft too much, we've actually got undersized bearings which we obtained in Australia and we're currently machining them to size to fit the crankshaft correctly. Once that's done, it will be mounted into the crankcase. This is the cross drive, it's a very important piece of kit. As we've already explained, it's a twin engine power pack, so at some point, both of these engines have to come together on a shared gear train to give you a single output shaft that feeds the gearbox. This also incorporates the vehicle clutches for each engine. And there's a f about five gear trains, all square cut, that run across this, um, and once it's rotated by the engines, you'll see it operates the takeoff for the gearbox and through the PTO shaft. On the top here is a drive that is used to run the compressor. And on the bottom here is a drive that's used to run the hydraulic pump for the power travis. So you can see there's an awful lot of systems here coming together in one component um, to deliver power throughout the um, power pack. When the cross drives are attached to the engines, they're attached via the bell housings on each of the end of the engines. These bolts here are used to secure them on either side. And then to run both engines together so that when you put your foot on the accelerator, both engines rev up to the same amount, there's a twin linkage here that runs off of the fuel injection pumps. Les is going to talk about the actual building of the engine and the block and etc. Uh, I just want to run through some of the ancillaries um, that we've been putting together while he's been building the main thing. Um, some of them you'll recognise from talking about earlier. We've got the timing case on the end here. The timing case feeds the fuel injection pump. There's also another drive coming off the timing case that fills dynamo. And then off of that is another drive that feeds the water pump. 
The starter motor's on the other side. I'll just point out some more to you. The oil filter, the fuel filter, and the air filter at the end there. It's mounted on our test stand. Um, this has been very useful. We've used this for three uh, tank engines so far, the Valentine, uh, one of the Russian ones, and here. We just adapt uh, the legs to suit whatever pack we're using. On the front is a dashboard, and on there is the starter button, and the oil pressure, and the temperature. And it's very important while these engines are running that we monitor those things, uh, and also check it for leaks. It's all part of the testing regime uh, that you need to do before you fit things, because if you don't, as something leaks later on, uh, you've got to remove an awful lot of stuff in order to get at it. This is a, a Leyland E160 engine, which is one of a pair that's used to propel the Matilda II tank. It's uh, basically a six-cylinder, uh, seven-litre engine that was produced by Leyland in 1939-1940 uh, and was probably initially used to power a truck or a bus. So that's why it needs two of them to drive a tank, which is significantly larger. Now this particular engine, uh, we've stripped completely down um, to a bare, bare block and bare crankcase. And uh, we've rebuilt it now with a number of new old components, because you obviously can't go to the, your local spares dealer and buy parts for an E160. Anyway, it's been rebuilt now with new uh, pistons and rings, new camshaft uh, with a, a set of followers and, and uh, uh, one new valve. We have actually had the engine running and it did start up straight away. Uh, the only problem is that the head gaskets that we fitted on it are somewhat thicker than the original ones and I was concerned that it might cause a deterioration in performance and in fact the engine did smoke quite badly. Uh, when we first started it. But mechanically it was sound, um, there were no nasty noises, we had a few small leaks that we've cured, um, but generally it was running quite well apart from the compression ratio being affected. Now to try and explain that a little bit more, the head gasket <coughs> sits between the top of the crankcase and the cylinder head and it acts as a seal to hold the gases in um, these gases are uh, running up to say maybe 15 or 1600 psi which is quite a lot of pressure so the gasket first of all has to withstand that gas pressure and secondly it has to seal water and oil because there has to be an interconnection between the water circulating around the engine and the oil because the oil is needed to lubricate the valves and the water is needed to cool the cylinder heads so this is quite a complicated piece of kit a head gasket because it's got to seal three things. Uh, now unfortunately the other thing it does um, is it changes the height of the cylinder head and effectively the volume above the piston. So when the piston comes up to compress the gas and, and start the uh, combustion process, if the head gasket's too thick, you actually end up with too large a volume above the piston and this can affect performance and that does seem to be the case. We've now taken the cylinder head off the engine and uh, this is the run gasket and we've measured the thickness of it in its compressed state and basically it's gone down to around about 65 thousandths of an inch uh, which is just over one and a half millimeters um, which is not good because we really wanted it to go down to 30 thousandths of an inch so it's basically too thick uh, these gaskets are losing us one of, around about one and a half compression ratios and the engine is designed to run at uh, 15 and a half to one so in fact but in fact we're only running it at 14 to one so we think that that could be the cause of the problem so we're going to have some new gaskets made that are a more suitable thickness for the engine and rebuild it now as an additional check while i've got this compressed gasket i actually took the cylinder head off and then I placed some special engineers plasticine on the top of the piston, rebuilt the cylinder head back on, retorked it to the correct level, reset all the tappets and turned the engine over several times. Now basically this was to measure the, the clearance cold 
between the piston and the cylinder head and between the valves and the top of the piston. And you'll notice there's cutouts in the piston to allow the valves to be slightly in moved at the point where the piston's at top dead center. Now the reason I've done all this careful measurement is what we don't want to do is put a thinner gasket on and then suddenly find that the piston is hitting the cylinder head or the valves are touching the piston, both of which would be very bad news for the engine. You can see behind me the engines all paired up with a cross drive fitted which forms the power pack for the Matilda. Um, in order to get to this stage we've had to jump through a number of hoops and this started off with refitting thinner gaskets in order to get the engines to run better and then both engines were run independently on a single test stand and that was important to cure any leaks and make sure that the engines were timed correctly. Then they were um, put together and they were run without the cross drive and the reason for that is so that we could synchronise the engines and match the revolutions. We didn't want to put the cross drive on um, if one engine was doing 500 RPM on idle and one was doing 1000 because that would have uh, caused damage to the cross drive. Once we completed this, the cross drive has been fitted. In the same way that the human body needs fuel, uh, needs uh, to keep cool, it needs energy. We have to provide all of those things for these engines when we run them outside of the tank. It's a good idea to try and use as much of the things that are fitted in the tank as possible because it gives us the opportunity to test them as we go. So from a standpoint of air then, we have the air intakes which we fitted to the front here. Um, these are oil bath air intakes which means that there's an oil film in the bottom which helps remove the dirt. It's very important that this type of engine with the governor gets clean air delivered to it. And what we wanted to do when we tested the engines in order to synchronise them was to set this up so that it was in a realistic condition as it would be in the tank. The throttles are controlled from butterfly valves inside this chamber here um, and that is the only um, throttle control for each engine. We've been asked some questions about how we've synchronised both of these engines and the techniques that, um, that you have to do. Um, it's quite tricky, we have to run the engines quite a few times, we have to run them warm as well to make sure that everything's bedded in. Um, essentially we start off with um, the throttle control and you, we talked about the two chambers here with the butterfly valves in. Now these have to be set with the gaps in them exactly the same so that when I operate the dual throttle control they both open and close at the same rate. We monitor this with the rev counter that you've seen on the crankshaft. The next thing we've got to make sure is that the two diaphragms that control the rack, i.e. the delivery of fuel into the pistons, the chambers have both got the same vacuum in them. This is partly controlled by this um, balance pipe that runs between the two fuel injection pumps. And then if we get any hunting in the engines at all, we have just a spring that press, presses on that diaphragm and increases or decreases the resistance. By doing that, and repeatedly and tweaking it, sometimes by small turns, we can get the both engines to run uh, together through the rev ranges, which we've checked at idle at 1,000, 1,500, and at just about 1,800. It's an important point to note that everything I talk about is doubled up, one for the left-hand engine and one for the right. We always talk, or when we um, talk, describe things in a tank, as if we were going from the rear of the vehicle. So everything on the left-hand side um, is actually on my right as I look at it here. We need fuel. Um, we've got diesel on jerry cans with special adapters that plumb straight into the fuel injection pumps. And then for lubricant, we're using the original oil tanks which we've mounted so that we can test um, that there's no leaks in the copper piping and that the shutoff valves also run dry. This coolant pack at the front maintains the engine at a constant temperature and this has been made up from old radiators that we've had and we've made this cooler pack and the reason we've done it uh, independently of the uh, 
radiators in their vehicle, is we want to be able to utilise this cooler pack when we run other engines. Uh, just carrying around the um, front, actually the rear of the engine, you'll see the exhausts, again doubled up, one for each of them, um, and we plumb them to the outside um, when we're running the vehicle. The other thing we need to provide is electricity in order to start both the engines initially. This is provided with a battery master switch which controls two uh, batteries. This feeds both starter motors, you can see one of them down here, which feeds the instrument panel. Controls on the instrument panel are very simple. We have a switch that isolates the left or the right hand engine. Once we um, chose which engine we want to start, we operate the starter button and the engine will fire up. Immediately we're looking then at its corresponding oil pressure gauge and we want to make sure that that goes up between 70 and 75 pounds on start up. And then as the engine's warm, we've got a coolant gauge in the middle here um, that we can again select left or the right hand engine and monitor the temperature of the engines as we run. This is very important because we want to make sure that this oil pressure is good through all the rev range and we want to make sure that the engines stay cool and we don't run them too long um, so they get hot. You'll appreciate that we can rig a Kenlo on the radiators, um, however we don't have the engine fans fitted because they're mounted on the gearbox. And the test that we were carrying out today um, was a test on the clutches to make sure that each engine can be started independently okay. and one engine would start off the other engine um, once we disengage or engage the clutch, uh, which is an important feature of this engine design. Having tested both engines individually, put them together, having built this test stand and tested them and synchronised them as a pair, then fitted the cross drive and checked the clutches to make sure they engage and disengage and start one engine from the other clutch. Now all that remains is to get this engine in the tank with the transmission, with the air system, with the steering and get all of it to talk to each other. Sounds simple but we've still got a way to go. This will do, John, don't worry about it.